The Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions will come to order. Chronic pain is a significant public health challenge that has yet to receive adequate attention, given the tremendous impact it has on people all across our nation. It's estimated that approximately 116 million adults in America, more than the number of adults affected by heart disease, cancer, and diabetes combined, suffer from some form of chronic pain. These often debilitating conditions have a tremendous impact on many daily activities, making it difficult for many individuals with chronic pain to even meet their own basic needs. Chronic pain profoundly affects quality of life. It remains one of the most challenging conditions to assess and effectively treat. I repeat that, it remains one of the most challenging conditions to assess and effectively treat. And now, with uh, Dr. John Sarno, as I said, Dr. Sarno was the author of four books, the first being Mind Over Back Pain in 1984, the second Healing Back Pain in 1991, the third is Mind Body Prescription 1998, and the fourth book is The Divided Mind, which I have right here in 2006. Uh, so uh, Dr. Sarno, welcome to our committee. Please proceed. Thank you, Senator Harkin. Thank you for inviting me. Pain syndromes can be grouped into two categories, those resulting from injury. This is the way I see it, from injury, surgery, or associated with severe infection, as seen in patients in an acute hospital setting. And those with pain in the back, neck, shoulders, and limbs of a psychophysical origin. The high incidence of the latter group has evoked, evolved into a public health problem of great magnitude over the past 40 years. It has been estimated that 80% of the population have a history of one of these painful conditions, which has led to the performance of a great deal of unnecessary surgery and the widespread use of pain medication. It is troubling to realize that the pattern of pain and physical examination findings often do not correlate with the presumed reason for the pain. For example, pain might be attributed to degenerative arthritic changes at the lower end of the spine, but the patient might have pain in places that had nothing to do with the bones in that area, or someone might have a lumbar disc that was herniated to the left and have pain in the right leg. More importantly was the observation that 88% of the people uh, with these pains had histories of such things as tension or migraine headache, heartburn, hiatus hernia, stomach ulcer, colitis, uh, spastic colon, irritable bowel syndrome, hay fever and asthma, that's quite a listing, eczema, and a variety of other disorders, all of which have been strongly suspected by physicians of being emotionally based. The pain syndrome here uh, referred to as a detention myoneural syndrome, we believe to be fundamentally emotionally, emotionally based. Simple awareness of the diagnosis itself we have found can be therapeutic and eliminate the pain. For some patients uh, who accept uh, the concept of what is going on, uh, it is necessary to work with a psychologist to get at the root of the problem. Although back pain may disappear spontaneously in many patients, it becomes a lifelong problem. There is no logic to the traditional physical treatment. Instead, experience has shown, my experience, that the only successful and permanent way to treat the problem is by teaching patients to understand what they have. A physician, because he recognizes both the physical and psychological dimensions of the condition, must make the diagnosis. This cannot be made by a psychologist or a psychiatrist. It goes without saying that pain syndrome must always be properly studied to rule out serious conditions such as cancer, tumors, bone disease, and many others. The presence of persistent pain anywhere requires a comprehensive examination and tests. 
Though this disorder, the tension myoneural syndrome, is the result of emotional phenomena, it is a physical disorder and must be studied as such. It is not, quote, in the patient's head, unquote. There is a need to raise consciousness both inside and outside the field of medicine to help people change people's perceptions of the cause of common pain syndrome, uh, which represent a major public health problem. Science requires, of course, that all new ideas be validated by experience and replication. It is essential that these ideas also be subjected to research study in the future. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Sarno. Now we'll start a series of five-minute rounds of questions, or I should say a dialogue with, with all of you. Um, well, Dr. Sarno, something you just said, I'm going to skip around here a little bit. Where is it that uh, Ms. Feasley said something uh, that I wanted to, oh yes, uh, Ms. Veasley, in, in talking about uh, uh, a report, said that that uh, uh, medical professionals are more likely to dismiss women's pain reports as emotional, psychogenic, hysterical, or oversensitive, quotes, and therefore not real, leading to more frequent mental health diagnosis. So I ask you, uh, is her pain real, or is it just in her head? The pain is always real. But I think the problem is it's not recognized sufficiently that emotional phenomena can actually bring on pain. If you uh, would like a physiologic explanation, that's simple too. The simple reduction of blood flow, which can easily be uh, uh, accomplished by the brain to vital spinal nerves, or any spinal nerve for that matter, but usually it's more in certain areas, the low back, for example, or the neck or shoulders, is easily done. And I think that it's important to recognize that emotions can stimulate physiologic change. The mechanisms and risks <clears throat> that result in chronic pain does not mean that it's made up in your mind and is not real. Thank you. If I might respond, I think what Dr. Sarna was saying, uh, and I've looked at this a lot, is it's not in, in someone's head. It's that certain psychological things that are happening in a person's unconscious can actually create things that cause real physical pain. As he said, the unconscious can sometimes, uh, in order to hide up a pain, uh, some, other, some other thing in your mind, uh, could stem the flow of oxygen to a muscle or to a nerve, that tightens it up, and you feel real pain. I, I don't think Dr. Sarno is in any way suggesting that this is anything in your head. It's just that certain uh, emotional or certain unconscious underlines of people's minds sometimes create the pathways to real physical pain. If I might, am I correct in that? Yes. Yeah. Uh as I said, emotional phenomena can be responsible for physiologic pain. And that's the important thing to bear in mind. Uh, I was interested um, by a couple, of, a couple of issues spring out to me. Uh, number one, uh, the uh, Institute of Medicine report found that a person with lower educational level uh, and I presumably also lower income people are more prone to suffer pain. Uh, as chair of the uh, Subcommittee on Primary Health Care, we did some months ago uh, a hearing on, on poverty as a death sentence. Mm -hmm. and, and what we found is that if you're in the bottom 20 percentile, you're going to die six and a half years earlier than if you're in the top 20 percent. I would imagine, uh, so I would like to ask you, uh, I guess what you're saying is that if you're poor, if you're uneducated, you're more likely to become ill. You're more likely to become ill. You're more likely to experience pain. Uh, could somebody speak to that? I mean, uh, Sarno? I would like to uh, suggest a uh, more Freudian, if you will, or psychodynamic explanation, and that is that poor people uh, are, are 
poor and they're angry. They're furious, as a matter of fact, uh, what society has allowed to happen. And that fury will evoke physical symptomatology, believe it or not, as a defense against the rage. They can't ra enrage, so what happens is that they get sick. And I believe that this is an extremely common phenomenon. I mean, rather than burning down the Capitol, they are turning that anger against themselves, right? Exactly. Um, Dr. Pizzo, you ever read any of Dr. Sarno's books? Uh, I, the Mind Over Back Pain, 1984, Healing Back Pain, 1991, Mind Body Prescription, 1998, or The Divided Mind, 2006. No, no I have not okay. read That's okay. Dr. Max, have you ever read any of his books? I have not, but I'm very familiar with uh, James Lang and Canon's theories, which I think are elaborated, I think, quite well in the books, is what I would guess. Ms. Veasley, have you ever read? Okay. Have you read your books, Dr. Sarno? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh. Here's why I asked that question. You can't read everything. Now, Ms. Veasley told her story. I'm going to tell you my story and why Dr. Sarno is sitting there and why, as chairman, I had him here. Mm -hmm. I'm a, I, I, I've always been healthy. Jet pilot in the Navy, physically active all my life, took pride in my physical health. In 1988, I just checked with the doctor's office over here. I didn't know it was that long ago. 1988. I had an episode with my back, extremely painful. I was walking down the hallway right out here in the Dirksen building, and my pain hit my back so hard I fell right on my butt, right out here. It's kind of embarrassing, you know. I didn't know what was happening to me. Uh, it got a little bit better, but at one point, and I was working, and then the next year I was working on the Americans with Disabilities Act, of all things, as the chairman of the subcommittee of this committee, and I couldn't even walk back and forth. I had to put a cot over in the Capitol for me to lay on. Shortly after that, I had an MRI. They looked at the MRI and said, well, you've got a, you've got a bulging disc causing you some problems. You should take an anti-inflammatory. So I did. The pain went away. About three or years after that, this is in the mid-90s. Again, I got back pains so bad. I was in Los Angeles. I was in a hotel room. I had to go to the bathroom. I couldn't even get, I had to crawl to get to the bathroom. I came back here, had another MRI. Well, you still have a bulging disc, but there's this little hole down there where all your nerves go through. That's my layman's term of putting it. And that thing's not so, maybe you need to have that thing opened up or something like that. And Well, I thought about that for a while, and I dismissed it because my back pain went away. You know, after a while, it went away. But every time it would come, I could barely sit, I could barely stand, I could barely move. Painful. I even had a chiropractor come into my office once. I had to take a plane trip someplace. He had to work over my back so I could even get on the airplane. Actually, it worked. Chiropractor worked made me feel better anyway, long enough to get on the airplane. And then in 2004, I had another episode. And it was really bad. And I remember I was at the National Convention up in Boston. I could barely move. In fact, I couldn't. I curtailed my activities there. I came back. And um, that was my third MRI. I sent them up to the hospital for special surgery in New York to have them looked at. I wanted to get another opinion. Well, yeah, I probably needed uh, steroid shots, and I needed to have that hole opened up, whatever that was. I had breakfast one morning with Dr. with not Dr. Mr. Ira Brind. He's the former uh, head, uh, chair of the University uh, Thomas Jefferson University Hospital in Philadelphia. Just a friend of mine, and I told him I wasn't looking forward to this. But I had checked with the doctors here, and they said I probably needed to have back surgery. In fact, one of the doctors had told me they had had back surgery and. They were fine. I really wasn't looking forward to that. So I told Ira, I said, yeah, well, I guess I'm going to have to have this back surgery. But it's been going on for all these years. He said, don't do it. <laughs> he said, don't do this until I'm going to send you something. I'm going to send you a CD and I'm going to send you a book and read those first before you take any action. 
I got him the next day, he sent him down the next day from Philadelphia. And it was a CD and a book by Dr. Sarno, Healing Back Pain. Well, I read this through and I thought, you know, that sounds like me. <laughs> that really sounds like me. And so I began to follow his regimen. That was in 2004. I haven't had a back pain since. I've never had any surgery. I've never had steroid shots or anything like that. I haven't had any back pain since. Now, that's not quite true. Every once in a while, I do get a little tinge of back pain, but I know what's causing it. I have the knowledge that I know what's causing it. Now, I'm going to expose myself here to this audience, whoever else is watching. Now, sometimes when I tell people this, they think I'm nuts. They say, well, what do you do? And I said, it's very easy. I talk to my back. <laughs> and what I say is basically, I don't have cancer. I don't have anything wrong with my spine. I don't have any injuries. So therefore, it's coming from stress. Somehow I'm being stressed out. And my spinal nerves and stuff are being deprived of oxygen. And that's what's causing it. So what I need to do is ignore that. And I need to go about my daily activities just as though I was completely well. And when I do that, it goes away. I don't know that the IOM is looking at this. Now, you might say, well, that's just you. This was a survey that was put in the book uh, uh, in 1999. And again, this is a small cohort. They had 104 patients on whom data was collected. The following year, they reached 85 of the group to determine the outcome. There were 39 males and 52 females in the group. And they were interested in the outcome. The categories of, for level of pain were as follows. 37 patients reported they now had little or no pain. 22 patients reported they were now 80 to 100% improved. 13 patients reported they were 40 to 80% improved. 13 patients reported no change to 40% improvement. 46 patients reported they were now un unrestricted physically. These figures are extraordinary when one considers that the treatment of this physical disorder is educational, augmented in some cases by analytically oriented psychotherapy. 70% of this group had good relief from pain and 75% were restored to normal or near normal physical function. So I wonder why we're not looking at things like this. Now, I have one more story. I have a near relative of mine, a close relative of mine. She was diagnosed with uh, fibromyalgia. Terrible pain. She's a young woman. And so because of my connections and things with NIH and stuff, I found some of the best doctors to talk to her about her fibromyalgia. And um, they did, and uh, I would, she lives up in Pennsylvania, and so I would talk to her every so often, ask her how she's getting along, and nothing was getting better. She had withdrawn from her family, withdrawn from everything. everything. I don't want to go into this in too much depth. Um, last year, I, I checked up on her. I wanted to check up on her, see how she was doing. She said, you know, she said, I think I've cured my fibromyalgia. I said, really? Was it that last doctor I set you up with? She said, no, a friend of mine gave me this DVD and a book by this Dr. Sarno in New York. Now, I had never mentioned his name to her. I hadn't thought about him in that context. And she now was, I wouldn't say totally pain-free, but over her fibromyalgia. And so when I see two things like this, one personal with me, I, my own self, and another with a close relative, I wonder why, why isn't this being looked at? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sarno, I've been kind of picking on you lately here. <laughs> Did you have anything else to, to add at all to, to, our, uh, to what we've been saying at all? I mean, you've been doing this for 40, Five. 45 years. <laughs> yeah. You've seen a lot of patients. Do you have anything else to add that you want? Not really. Uh, it's just the, the, the idea that in medicine in general, 
uh, there's a tendency to look at things from the anatomical and physiologic point of view and perhaps not recognize the impact of emotions on these on, on the physiology and that's the only thing that I would say. Keep an open mind about that because well, I believe that there Well I hope that we'll do more research in that area. That's that's what I hope that that's, that this this group will now start to take a, a closer a closer look at that. Dr. Maxner you talked about the barriers, uh, the mismatch of money at NIH. I couldn't agree more. We're going to take a look at that. This committee will well my other committee that I wear another hat on, the Appropriations Committee. We'll take a look. We're going to, we're going to look at that. Um, you talked about education, only nine sessions in medical school on this. It was something so prevalent. And I sort of said that in the beginning. How do we get our residencies and stuff more in tune with diagnosing people and, 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 and focusing on pain? Um, uh, well, you also mentioned the doctor shopping and what's happening there. Again, I think that comes up. We need to educate our doctors and our practitioners, our primary care people, a little bit better uh, than what we have been doing in the past. Ms. Veasley, you bring a very poignant personal story to this. There are just a lot of people like you around this country. Uh, maybe not with vulvodynia, but with fibromyalgia, uh, irritable bowel syndromes, uh, uh, back pain. <laughs> all kinds of things that, uh, that we just need to know more about and, and, and how, we, how we do more research, get more research into these areas, no doubt about it. So you bring a very strong personal story. Um, Dr. Pizzo said we need new innovative therapies that we may not know about. <laughs> I think that's, that's pretty profound. Uh, we need new innovative therapies we may not know about. So how many people out there on this community stuff don't know about 45 years of practice and treating people and honing this to a, to a fine degree on, on how you treat people with uh, chronic pain that has no, now this is where I shouldn't practice medicine without a license, but without a physiological basis. Um, and I think Dr. Sarno mentioned that the first thing to do is also always look at that. You do that first. And then if there's nothing there, then you have to move to a, a different modality. And this is my own statement. Uh, I think there's just too many people in our society. This is what you talked about, Dr. Maxter. Some of us are equipped somehow different people think different ways. P different people can cope with things differently and, and, and assess things differently. But I just, and this is my own judgment, I think there's just too many people in our country think that there's a pill, a drug, or a surgery that's going to cure whatever you have. And I think maybe we've been brought up to think that, and that there's something out there, if I just get the right pill, the right drug, the right surgery, it's going to cure me. And uh, I don't know that we've put enough into the upfront prevention. And I guess I'll close on this, that when I think about prevention in the area of pain, it's educating not just the doctors and the residencies, but people. <laughs> when they come through school, when they go through school, that they are knowledgeable about pain and chronic pain and what causes pain and how you deal with these things. And so that they become more knowledgeable about their own systems and how different things affect them. And so then maybe then we won't always be thinking that there's, we can just do whatever we want. There's a pill or a drug or a surgery out there that's going to cure what ails us. Uh, but there's a lot here. I mean, we have to do more research in this area, but it has to be broad. And I will continue to say that this whole area of mind-body cannot be just a footnote. It has to be integral to this whole search that we're doing on how to relieve so many people that have real pain, real pain. Not in your head, it's in your body. <laughs> Where it comes from, we don't know yet. But, uh, but it's, that's one thing I have learned from Dr. Sarno, that this is real physical pain. It's not in your head, it's real physical pain. 